Look at us doing what Victorians can't do. Good on us. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name's Clint O'Brien, and I'm CEDA's National Associate Director of Program and Innovation. CEDA, of course, is a national public policy organisation. We progress good economic and social policy for Australia's future development. CEDA acknowledges today that we meet on Aboriginal land, today and every day. We respect elders and support their stated aspirations, and of course, the creation of an economy and a society in which First, Na First Nations people genuinely thrive. In the coming financial year, CEDA is working with its members and stakeholders across the country, across academia, across all sectors, and across governments to ask five crucial questions. The one which you can expect to see us be very pointy on in the coming 12 months is how can Australia achieve climate resilience and regain our energy advantage? Throughout the coming year, we'll be focused on the impacts of climate change, resilience and adaptation, the energy transition, and the role of alternative energy sources in our economy. The global, transition, the global energy transition is, of course, already underway right now. The motivation is compelling and hopefully by now well understood, and the implications are complex. There is much expertise in the matter, on the options and the alternatives, and there are many, many voices and many players. Today here in Brisbane, we continue work we're running across the country to connect, inform, and to better understand the economic opportunity hydrogen presents. As a state, we are, of course, not the only show in town, nor is Australia internationally, for that matter. Since Dr. Alan Finkler released the National Hydrogen Strategy on the CEDA platform, many other states have also progressed their plans to deliver on the opportunity. But, of course, we're almost at state of origin season, and so I'm going with back at Queenslander. Um, absolutely. Uh, so it's great to have so much expertise in the room here today as we discuss our aspiration and our plans. Today we'll hear from committed leaders in this area, from our speakers, our panellists, and from our sponsor organisations. The Honourable Mick de Brenny, Minister for Energy, Renewables and Hydrogen, and Minister for Public Works and Procurement, Tracy Boys, the General Manager, Future Growth at Origin, Darren Miller, the Chief Executive of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and our panellists, Paul Gleeson, Managing Director, Energy, Resources and Water at Oricon, and Dr. Maya Schweitzer, Chief Executive Officer at Cleanco, who I might add was kind enough to join our program a little later than we had intended, um, but who many of you in this space will already know is absolutely brilliant. So Maya, a welcome addition. Thank you very much for coming along today, and thank you all for being here. For their continued work with CEDA, I would like to thank CEDA members and major sponsors of today's event, Oricon, Clayton Oots, PwC, all of who are lending us their own considerable expertise today. Shortly, you'll hear from Emma Kovacevic, Deputy Chief Executive Partner at Clayton Newts, who will get us underway. And then from Sally Torgerman at PwC, the Managing Director of Infrastructure Lead Advisory, who has kindly agreed to be the moderator of today's discussion and of your questions. So, thank you to our sponsors and to all of those organisations hosting corporate tables here today, which you'll see on the screen behind me now. I'd also like to welcome and thank CEDA State Advisory Council members, Tanya Hornick, Tasman Graham, and Brett Lightfoot for being with us today, and acknowledge the Honourable Di Farmer MP, Lance, McCall Lance McCallum MP, Colin Boyce MP, and Catherine Sinclair, immediate past president of our State Advisory Council at CEDA here in Queensland. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Wayne Swan for joining us here today for what has largely been a career of service to his constituents and, of course, to our entire country. In the program you'll see that you've been emailed, you'll see the agenda for today, but in a moment, Emma will introduce the topic and our speakers will then hear from the minister, then stop for lunch and reconvene after to progress through our program and your questions. While we're on questions, today we'll be using the Pigeonhole app, of which you'll see the details now magically on the screen, well-timed gang, and of course um, you can enter your questions there and vote on questions that others have put forward. Today, and because we are in Queensland, we'll also be kicking it old school and bring around mics, so if you'd like to raise your hands, you can ask a question that way of any of our panellists as well. So, let's get underway. To join me now, please welcome Emma Kovacevic to the stage. Check your phones are on silent, and if you feel the twitch to tweet, do follow Twitter. Do follow Twitter. How about do follow Cedar at at Cedar underscore news, and we'll be using the hashtag hydrogen today. Thanks very much.
I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, the Turrbal people and the Jagera people, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. My name is Emma Kovacevic. In addition to being a practising partner in the Energy and Resources Group of Clayton Utes, I'm also the Deputy Chief Executive Partner. And in that capacity, I'm responsible for our clients and markets and our international relationships. I'm proud to have grown up in Queensland and to have had a career spanning more than two decades in the energy and resources sector. During this time, the team in which I work has witnessed firsthand how the energy and resources sector has evolved both locally in Queensland and across Australia. Not even 15 years ago, Western Queensland was still to experience the arrival of the international majors that marked the emergence of what is now a $60 billion LNG industry. But now we are seeing a relatively rapid transition to a low carbon and net zero environment. As companies and governments commit to net zero emissions in line with increasing pressure to achieve a clean energy future, we will need to transition to new technologies to continue to meet our energy needs. With the increasing uptake in wind and solar and a trend of reduced pricing for renewables, storage solutions and grid stability are even more essential to capitalise on these opportunities. Turning though to hydrogen, Hydrogen is the most abundant element on the Earth. It can be extracted through electrolysis using renewable energy sources to produce green hydrogen, and electrolysis through coal and natural gas with carbon capture and storage to produce blue hydrogen. And the possibilities for a cleaner energy future through the use of hydrogen present in a range of opportunities. For the transport sector, which is our largest consumer of energy, Hydrogen has the potential to be a viable alternative for the fueling of buses, trucks, ships, and trains. For the manufacturing industry, there is also the potential for hydrogen to solve some of our largest emissions challenges. Our existing pipeline infrastructure and export facilities have the potential to open us to global markets, and that also means we're well placed here in Queensland, right here at home, to lead a prospective and viable industry. To seize on these opportunities, government and the private sector will need to work together with agility and in reliance of the best science available to position Queensland as a prosperous and viable producer. I'm genuinely excited to be here today to talk about this emerging industry. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honourable Mick de Brenny, Minister for Energy, Renewables and Hydrogen and Minister for Public Works and Procurement. Please join me in welcoming the Honourable Mick Brenny. Thanks very much, Emma. Can I join with you and I, I'm sure all of the attendees uh, here today uh, in firstly uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to Elders past, present uh, and emerging. Can I acknowledge all of the CEDA team for making uh, today happen? I know that events like this uh, don't happen uh, without a lot of effort uh, from all of the team. Uh, and of course, I want to acknowledge uh, the terrific sponsors uh, that uh, made this possible today. I want to acknowledge all of you in the audience today, uh, Queensland's uh, top thinkers, uh, policy shapers that have come together today. I want to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Minister uh, Di Farmer, the Minister for, importantly, Employment uh, and Small Business. I want to acknowledge my Assistant Minister and other MPs. Uh, there are a number of senior departmental uh, leaders and staff here today. Can I thank them uh, for their dedication of service uh, to Queenslanders as well? And as uh, Emma mentioned, uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, the uh, directors of our government owned electricity uh, network businesses, uh, including one of those, uh, Wayne Swan, uh, former uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister uh, and acknowledged as uh, the world's uh, finest treasurer of his time. Uh, can I uh, start uh, my remarks today by talking about a topical matter? You'll have seen uh, this photo, I think, uh, on uh, your newspaper or on your news feed. 
Exactly two weeks ago, uh, there was a catastrophic failure at the Calide C power station. That is Unit 4 at Calide C that you heard so much about. It's like a six inch thick Coke can, effectively torn apart, and the bits and pieces of the turbine inside uh, sprayed everywhere uh, up in Biloela. Close to 400,000 homes lost power that afternoon uh, across the southeast and some parts of northern New South Wales uh, as well. And when that happened, uh, Parliament was sitting uh, and we set up a, uh, a control room in Parliament and I authorised from that room uh, with the support of uh, AEMO, uh, Powerlink, EQL, of course the team at CS uh, and my department, I authorised three things. The first one was that I authorised rolling load shedding. Uh, I authorised rolling load shedding for the first time in Queensland that someone in my position has had to do that in 35 years. Uh, fortunately, uh, we didn't need to do that in the end, and I want to acknowledge uh, at that point uh, all of the team uh, at EQL, Powerlink, uh, and our, our government-owned generators, but more broadly the energy generators across Queensland uh, for stepping up uh, in that time of need. The second thing that we uh, did was that we instructed Powerlink and Energy Queensland to contact their large-style customers uh, and ask them to scale back their energy use. We asked those big industrial users in Queensland uh, to put the rest of the state uh, before their own profits, and they did that. And I think in true Queensland spirit, uh, that was a tremendous outcome, uh, and I want to thank them for that. The third thing that I did, uh, and it's great that Jackie and Maya are here from Cleanco, is that I asked Cleanco to turn on the Wyvernhoe pumped storage. Uh, and the Swan Bank E power station as well. Now, Wyvernhoe pumped hydroelectric power station ramped up to produce 530 megawatts over a four hour period that night, quite literally keeping the lights on in Queensland. Now, a few years ago, I'm advised that Wyvernhoe was operating at about 1%, just 1% today, it is now 400% higher. And so what that day taught us was that Pumped hydro means reliable energy for Queenslanders. And today, I can announce the second initiative of the $1.84 billion Queensland Jobs Fund that was launched right here at the, at the convention centre on the weekend by the Premier and Deputy Premier. Uh, this is the second announcement from the fund uh, following the vaccine manufacturing initiative at the Translational Research Institute. And I think that's the right priority order. We'll do the vaccine first and then we'll do these other things second. Uh, but the, uh, the uh, initiative that I'm announcing today, the second from the Queensland Jobs Fund, uh, is pumped hydro for Queensland. Today I can announce that the Palaszczuk government will invest $22 million to progress pumped hydro at Barumba Dam, Dam in southeast Queensland. This will deliver one gigawatt, 24 hours of capacity, and importantly, 2,000 jobs in construction for Queenslanders. This initiative at Barumba will be the first truly large-scale pumped hydroelectricity scheme in Queensland. It will be second only in its capacity to the Snowy Scheme. Our investment will include detailed engineering and design, and of course there will be the, the usual assessment of environmental impacts and community consultation. Uh, but this, friends, this will be nation building infrastructure. This will be generational infrastructure. We're committed to getting it done. Uh, that's why today I'll also ask the Commonwealth to work with us on the important funding task. Now, I hope you'll forgive me uh, for that little detour into pumped hydro, but it is absolutely critical. Pumped hydro is absolutely critical for Queensland's renewable future and therefore our hydrogen future. And more specifically, before we, we turn to the future, I want to ask, I want to pose this question. Just two years ago, who of us would have thought that the Queensland Government, traditionally known as a, a dominant player in the fossil fuel market, would appoint a Minister for Renewables and Hydrogen? But think about it for a second, it makes sense. Because if we go back to 2007, there was a goal to build an export scale LNG industry here in Queensland. Eight years later, the first tanker full of liquefied natural gas left the port of Gladstone. Five years after that, Australia overtook Qatar to become the world's biggest exporter of LNG. So in appointing the world's first minister for hydrogen, 
the role that I have the uh, honour and privilege to hold, Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk was making a very, very clear statement to our state, to the nation and to the world. The statement was that Queensland is committed to developing its role as a renewable energy superpower. And we are ready, we are ready to step up to the plate and meet the demand for clean energy and build prosperity for Queenslanders along the way. We think that we can play a massive role in the global decarbonisation effort. We know that the world's economies are demanding more and more energy than ever, but now they want it without the carbon emissions, which is why we're all here today talking about hydrogen. So just quickly, for those in the room that aren't chemical or electrical engineers, just some quick facts. Hydrogen, the lightest of all elements, number one on the periodic table. You electrolyse about nine litres of water and you've got yourself a kilo of hydrogen. Uh, it's been widely used across a range of industries for centuries. First hydrogen fuel cell uh, used in the mid 1800s, in the mid 1800s. Uh, both Toyota and Hyundai have hydrogen fuel cells in production. In fact, it was the Hyundai Nexo that broke records. It travelled 887 kilometres, so range anxiety gone, on a single tank last month. 6.27 kilograms of hydrogen is all it took. But where it really comes into its own, I think, will be the heavy vehicle and mass transport space in the trucks, the buses, the trams and the trains. So there you go, if you took down those notes, you've got some lines to throw around at the barbecue on the weekend. But we know that global warming uh, is, uh, that, that, uh, sorry, we know that uh, global demand uh, is growing. Uh, and the International Energy Agency tells us demand will double over the next 10 years. And by 2050, uh, the world will be looking for an enormous amount of hydrogen each year. They'll be looking for 500 million tonnes per annum of hydrogen. And I just want to put that into perspective for a moment. That big LNG market that I spoke about, we exported 22.47 million tonnes of LNG last year. Renewable hydrogen could be 20 times the size of our LNG export market. And fortunately, all of you, us together, we've got form in this space because we know how to develop an energy export market from a standing start. Hydrogen is simply our next frontier. So the question is, what does our pathway look like? Well, at the recent Hydrogen, uh, Hydrogen Council conference, I compared uh, Queensland's uh, hydrogen mission to that of uh, the space race that NASA was involved in. Uh, and just like the US did uh, with NASA, we'll need our best and brightest minds working on this. And just as Kennedy did uh, with NASA, the Palaszczuk government is pulling together our very, very brightest. We've set up a 42-member Ministerial Energy Council that has had its first meeting just a few weeks ago. Uh, we've assembled a hydrogen task force chaired by uh, Professor Peter Ashworth, the director of UQ's Leverus Academy. Uh, we've appointed our strategic hydrogen advisor, uh, Professor uh, Ian McKinnon. Uh, in, in, in true Queensland fashion, just like we did when the Calide incident happened, we're going to work best when we work together. Uh, and I want to recognise or take the opportunity to recognise my Assistant Minister for Hydrogen and the achievement of the Queensland Renewable Energy Target by 2030, the member for Bundamba, Lance, uh, Lance McCallum. I want to recognise that we've appointed three hydrogen champions in the members uh, for Redlands, Rockhampton and Mundingborough. We have assembled a NASA-esque team and I'm confident that we will seize every available opportunity, including in the emerging supply chain. So why Queensland and why now? Well, the answer is, of course, that uh, ever-growing abundance of cheap renewable energy. Now, our place where we live, where we call home, here in our little part of the surface of the planet, has us in pole position to become a renewable hydrogen producer. Uh, we are, of course, the Sunshine State. We all know that. But you've got to make it work for you too. You've got to make it work for you too. When the, when the Palaszczuk government took office in 2015, there was not a single large-scale wind or solar project in existence in Queensland, not a single one. Today, there's over 5,150 megawatts of operational and committed renewable projects across the state. Projects that you will have heard of, like the 
526 Meg McIntyre Wind Farm, the 450 Meg Clark Creek Wind and Solar Project, the 400 Meg Western Downs Green Power Hub, but we're not stopping there. The Queensland Jobs Fund announced on the weekend will allocate another $145 million to establish our three renewable energy zones, the first of which has already commenced with the 157 Meg Caban Wind Farm, the cornerstone. It's in construction now in the North Queensland Renewable Energy Zone. And this Thursday, later this week, uh, there'll be a groundbreaking ceremony on Gen X's 250 megawatt Kidston pumped storage hydro project. What we're going to do then is we're going to play to our traditional strengths as well. And front and centre of those traditional strengths are our publicly owned ports. Recent uh, memorandums of understanding signed by both Townsville and Gladstone Port corporations have locked global investors into investing in Queensland. Now, Origin Energy's uh, General Manager of Future Growth, Tracy Boys, uh, is uh, on the panel today, and I'm sure that she'll take the opportunity to talk in more detail about their plans for Townsville with Kawasaki. We've got Gladstone Ports Corporation working with Sumitomo uh, to progress a hydrogen ecosystem uh, in central Queensland. Uh, elsewhere, we've got CS Energy and Japanese company IHI. They're building a demonstration plant out at Kogan Creek. And our publicly owned generator, Stanwell, is partnering with Japanese industrial heavyweight Iwatani. They will develop an export scale facility outside of Gladstone. And it's that project, the Stanwell Iwatani project, that I just want to take a moment to talk about a little bit more. Because today I could announce uh, that publicly owned Stanwell has secured a 236 hectare site just outside of Gladstone. Here, they will build the largest hydrogen production facility in Queensland, a three gigawatt project. It will be another massive job creating initiative for Queensland. We will capitalise on our opportunities with millions of tonnes of renewable hydrogen to be exported around the world. And the great thing, friends, is that renewable hydrogen is going to have a stamp on it. It's going to say, made in Queensland by Queenslanders. The Stanwell project will create more than 5,000 jobs for Queenslanders. And that's thanks to our Buy Queensland procurement policy uh, that's making sure that the benefits will flow through to our local construction and manufacturing businesses and their workforce. In fact, I want to let you know that that policy has invested, has seen us invest $33 billion with Queensland businesses since its inception in 2030, uh, 2017. And even better than that, uh, since we set a target uh, for small business procurement just a couple of years ago, a target that we have smashed, we have seen an $800 million uplift of investment with small and medium Queensland enterprises. So backing our renewable sector is an important part of our economic recovery plan because we know, we know that renewables create jobs, just like those 5,000 jobs in central Queensland. And that's why over the weekend we announced support we announce as key tenants of the energy and hydrogen sector uh, as pillars of the Queensland Jobs Fund, our 1.84 billion jobs fund. Our aim of that fund is to turbocharge job creation in Queensland through industries like the development of the hydrogen industry. Uh, and the Queensland Jobs Fund is a coordinated set of incentives to drive investment and deliver that jobs growth. And it will be focused on areas like hydrogen and renewables. So I want to wrap up. Right now, I think we can all agree that Queensland is the place to be. In fact, tomorrow night, Townsville will be the place in Queensland to be. Uh, but with the opportunities that we'll discuss today and we've outlined today, be they a huge pumped hydroelectric project, uh, the significant investment by publicly owned Stanwell, it means our economic recovery is well underway. We are creating growth in industries, we're delivering jobs, we're investing in advanced manufacturing. We are developing right here today the resources industries of the future and we are attracting more businesses to Queensland and we're attracting more investment to Queensland and Australia. So our message to Queenslanders, to all of you, uh, is clear. Whether 
Queenslanders are still getting back on their feet following the pandemic, or, like those of you here in the room, are thinking about the next big opportunity. It has been our economic recovery plan. It will be our Queensland Jobs Fund that will deliver, that will deliver our nation the renewable energy and renewable hydrogen superpower that our nation deserves. And friends, I'm pleased to say that is right here in Queensland. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Minister. We'd now like to invite everyone to lunch. Thank you.